there's a war going on between the institutions, and GME is the battleground. GameStop is not over. Roaring Kitty continues to perplex us. And now Peruvian Bull is here to help us all understand what's happening. He sees the crime that's happening. I think he's disgusted. I think he he knows that this this co these companies are heavily naked shorted. They're heavily manipulated. And they've been being driven into the ground by this cabal of people who are parasites on the back of capitalism. If Ryan Cohen is able to cr create kind of like a quasi-Amazon competitor, that's a conglomeration of all these smaller companies. And he already has proven that he can beat Amazon, right, in the pet food segment. Chewy was able to grow to an $11 billion company with a yeah. billion dollars in revenue. Literally. competing against Amazon, proving that Amazon does not have the a unipolistic monopoly on everything. I believe Trump might have a role to play in this naked short, this war against naked shorting. I'm here to tell you very, very quickly about how I am absolutely exploding my growth on YouTube. This tool is called Cast Magic. So, all you have to do is input your link to Cast Magic. It will give you a transcript of your entire podcast or YouTube show. It will give you all of the AI content you could ever imagine, including introductions, speaker bios, keywords, titles, timestamps, threads promotional tweets, blog posts, and much, much more. You even get magic chat where people can treat your podcast like ChatGBT and ask questions about it. There's so much more. Cast magic and use code CASTING30 to get 30% off. Okay, thank you. I hope that was fast. Enjoy the podcast. Uh, hello, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Chatter. Today, I am absolutely delighted to be joined by Peruvian Bull. Uh, GME enthusiast, YouTuber, and finance and macro writer. Uh, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me on, Josh. I appreciate it. Yeah, not a problem, man. Yeah, we, we did this once before, and uh, the audio file corrupted, which hasn't happened to me in years. So that was a fun one. Um, it turned out there was a driver that needed updated, much like Microsoft. Uh, <laughs> so today... As recording, we're recording on Friday for people for reference before mm. we talk about GME. But today we've experienced what people are describing as the biggest tech outage in human history. What do you reckon? What what's gone wrong? What have people done? Well, again, I'm not a tech person. I don't think we we're talking about this before the show, right? But <laughs> um, it, it seems like some most people are saying that this was simply, uh, you know. Uh, a buggy uh, update that CrowdStrike, you know, uploaded to their to the cloud platform that updated all Windows and then crashed basically all Windows computers. But other people that I've I've talked to that are pretty intelligent think that it's a cybersecurity attack, um, and that it was orchestrated by a nation state actor. And again, that's very tinfoily. I haven't seen any evidence of that yet, so I'm going to wait to withhold judgment. Um, but at, at least we know that uh, there are hundreds of thousands, if not millions, of computers down across the world. Um, air, airlines and even the London Stock Exchange have halted. Mm. Um, a lot of right. banks are having issues processing transfers. Uh, yeah, it's just everything is is kind of going to shit right now, which is kind of interesting. So mm. we'll see how it goes. It's almost as if we shouldn't be relying on centralized systems yes yes it's almost as if that's that seems to be a recurring theme throughout the 2020s mm, doesn't it so yeah the the last time that i had you on the show uh we it was literally right around the time that roaring kitty had re-emerged into uh the limelight i guess you would say uh, somewhat <laughs> And he, yeah, posted his positions. Uh, turns out he somehow accumulated millions and millions and millions of dollars in, or millions and millions of shares, um, multiple millions of dollars, right up to being worth, uh, at one point, a billion dollars. And then, since then, the price has spiked upwards, uh, come down a bit, stagnated somewhat. Uh, we've got news that Roaring Kitty had bought shares of Chewy, what what on earth yeah. is what, what do you think is going on 
at the moment. Well, that's what I'm trying to figure out, right? Because Roy Kitty, you know, he's absent for three years. He comes back. He buys back. He shows up, first of all, with, you know, four – 4.2 million more shares than he had before in yeah. GameStop. So his share position grows from 800,000 to 5 million. Um, and he starts tweeting like a madman. And the stock price rips upward. We get a gamma ramp. And this is all also coincident with major op, major swap expiries. So there mm -hmm. were several large swaps expiring. Um, it was May 15th, May 28th, May 31st, and June 3rd were the largest swap expiries. And he comes back out of the blue and starts playing um, playing the swap dates. Yeah. And then he goes silent in you know mid-May. After about a week of tweeting, he goes silent and doesn't say anything, and the stock kind of trades sideways. And then on, on June 2nd, I believe it is, um, he tweeted that Sunday night another Uno reverse card and the next morning, the stock rips up. That's a major swap exp expiration date. Roaring Kitty is, you know, like playing options again. And the Gamma Ramp bills all that week. GameStop dilutes again because this massive price spike is is building and, and you know, potentially causing, uh, you know, some pain for some shorts. But GameStop has larger plans, right? They've been signaling through their documents that they – are looking into potential merger or acquisition and they want to build cash for that. So they have, you know, 4 billion plus of cash right now raised from these, these at the money are offerings, uh, make shelf offerings and roaring kitty, um, posts his positions and shows that he's also has, you know, this massive options positions that's pinning the stock at $20, um, building a call wall. And, as the stock becomes more volatile and as it, it just is ripping up and down, he eventually decides to just exercise his shares and or he sells the options and just buys shares and accumulates 9 million and 1,000 shares in GameStop, which is which is coincidentally right the same amount of shares that was acquired by Ryan Cohen in August of 2020 when he started buying in heavy into GameStop and wanted to become chairman of the board. Mm -hmm. Um Right, basically doing an activist investor takeover. And so, um, you know, he he posts his position several times, then he disappears again. And then we get the news via an SEC filing in early July that, holy shit, he has bought also. So he has like $250 million of GME, you know, 9 million shares or so. And he also acquires $250 million of Chewy. And conspiracy theories were abounding of, as to what caused this, right? Um, and you know, there's there's two or three. Maybe we could say there's there's two main options. One is that he sold this GameStop stock and and uh, basically like rolled the profits over into Chewy, which I think is that's an incredibly weak argument. And a lot of people like Amit Investing and several other twi FinTwit accounts, Finance Lot, were saying that. They're like, look, he, he pump and dumped retail, and now he's moving on to the next stock. But I don't see the fundamentals for Chewy as being markedly different than the positive fundamentals for GameStop. Mm -hmm. And I also don't see, um, you know, I don't see the squeeze potential for Chewy that there was for Game, and that there still is for GameStop. So the idea that he would sell after all these years of having a singular play that he made $250 million on mm. um, is kind of asinine. And again, the, the reasons that were given were, one, he didn't like the, the shareholder meeting. The shareholder meeting was boring and bland. And yes, it was, but so is every single shareholder meeting mm. of every company. Yeah, they're, they're basically a legal formality, right? They're not an actual long-form... Um, you know, discussion on the company's future plans. And then the other reason was, oh, well, he's tired of the shorts and the manipulation and the stock keeps keep getting whipsawed and he's realizing that he's, you know, tired of this of this shit. Yeah, but he's been in this with much more severe price volatility and he's still doubled and tripled and quadrupled down all yeah. along the way. Yeah. This Repeatedly. doesn't strike me as like, like yeah. yeah. Over multiple years. 
Exactly. It's like, you remember, like, do you think he's really sick of almost being worth a billion at one point? Do you think? Yeah. Do you think he's really tired of of accumulating millions and millions of shares? Yeah. I, I, no. I, you, yeah. <laughs> I don't think so. There's no way. <laughs> and so, and so, then the question is: Okay, so okay, he didn't. He he couldn't have been getting pissed at the shareholder meeting, and he couldn't have, um, you know, been getting pissed because of short manipulation. And so, what's going on here? And I think the likely explanation is that he has more cash than we even know about mm. and he rolled that cash into chewy and he's banking on a cross equities play that involves more than just gamestop and so the working theory is he has he's getting his fingers in the pie of every company that ryan cohen's involved in because maybe he believes uh you know correctly or incorrectly that ryan cohen has a plan and that ryan Cohen's plan involves his former company chewy and now this i looked at the numbers it looks unlikely that gamestop could because chewy's market cap is around 11 billion mm. and gamestop's market market cap is around 6 billion depending on where the stock price is day to day and gamestop also has 4 billion in cash mm -hmm. so it would basically take everything gamestop has to do an acquisition a straight acquisition now could the two companies merge that's a more potential solution where each each uh, each company shareholder gets shares in the other company, and they become one entity, right? What, what would be right? Like, what would be the benefit there for, like, as a as a as a business for to to improve the fundamentals? What is what does merging those two companies do for the, for each other? Well, see, that's the that's the question, right? And I think Chewy is a pet food supply company. Yeah, and GameStop is a game and you know development um you know yeah game and and, and use collectibles basically company mm -hmm. and so on the surface these these two things have no correlation right and if you were looking at them in isolation you would also believe that oh my god gamestop's interesting but it's not that um it's not that unique and and chewy and gamestop combined don't really make a uh meaningful thesis unless you take into account the idea that Ryan Cohen might be trying to build a larger competitor to GameStop or to, to Amazon. Sorry. Mm. So if he's building a larger competitor to Amazon, if he wants to build a, if he wants to have ownership in all these companies that compete against Amazon in specific segments, this, a combination like this could make sense. Right. And this would also justify, right. The people saying the same thing about, um, Bed Bath and Beyond, right? Mm. Why is Ryan Cohen listed as a creditor on their legal documents? And I don't know. But if Ryan Cohen is trying to create a massive competitor to Amazon and he's trying to get pieces of each of of companies that are in certain industry verticals that can compete with Amazon on a one to one basis, yeah. or maybe the, the or the companies that were potentially seller boxed and you know were busted out by Amazon and Bain Capital. Then this could be a potential, um, you know, this could be his potential strategy. And so yeah. again, you look at you look at all the companies that that could have could be targeted, right? Mm -hmm. We're talking about Toys R Us, we're talking about Sears, we're talking about Bed Bath and Beyond, we're talking about um, Chewy, we're talking about GameStop. Yeah, like all these segments are segments that that Amazon now has a virtual monopoly over. But if if Ryan Cohen is able to cr create kind of like a quasi Amazon um, competitor, that's a conglomeration of all these smaller companies. And he already has proven that he can beat Amazon, right? In the pet food segment, Chewy was able to grow to a bill, you know, $11 billion company with yeah. billion dollars in revenue Literally. competing against Amazon, proving that Amazon does not have the, you know, the a unipolistic monopoly on everything. Right, they can be taken down. They're not the invincible giant that most people think they are. And so, if, if Ryan Cohen can do it with um, with Chewy, and if he can do it with GameStop, which is he's, he's in process of doing, maybe he can do it with all these other companies, and he can form kind of a you know a giant holding company that owns pieces of all these smaller companies and tries to take on Amazon and and um, you know beat them at their own game, basically. Yeah.
Yeah, it's really interesting, actually. There's a part in my book. I'm just going to share this with people a little bit. So people get to see a preview of my book. Oh, my God. How exciting. Go pre-order it. You're going to show your screen? Um, yeah, I'm just I'm sharing it with with the just on uh, on screen, but you can't see it. But I'm just going to read out uh, some parts that I, I wanted to show people. Uh, so it's a it's a it's a chat it's a sub chapter called amazon killer um about yeah there's some some somewhat about this rivalry between ryan cohen and jeff bezos so uh he actually told forbes in january 2020 not long after having acquired gamestop that no one wanted to invest in someone going head to head against amazon so he was talking about uh what it was like finding chewy so that's something that's been in his mind for a long time. He's talked about it, obviously, before, um, having gone against Amazon as they attempted to take him on in the pet food market. But then later on, he just continues to steal Amazon um, or former Amazon staff as well through uh, the beginning of 2021 and through the rest of the year. There was nothing but him acquiring Amazon staff. So I'm just trying to find the place in my book so I can give you some more stuff. Doubling down, no, aftermath. I'm not sure where I have it. Aha, delivering results, that's it. So um, he stole uh, Mark Francis, former AWS. Uh, Kelly Durkin was uh, also at Chewy. Then... Josh Kruger, formerly of Amazon. Um, Elliot Wick, or Wilk, formerly of Amazon. Uh, Nada Pacifico, formerly of Amazon. Uh, these are all like, yeah, high up managerial positions. They were, um, they went with Gemma Owens, also formerly of Amazon, um, to be COO. Um, Anchor Goyle, former seven year Amazon director, joined the board in July, 2021. It's, it's an unbelievable list. Is what I'm getting out of, of people that he's taken on from Amazon. So if you were going to try and take them on, theoretically, you'd want to hire a lot of people who understood how that game was played. Yeah, exactly. And so, the, again, like, the question is, right, what's his broader plan? What is he doing? And if DFE sees this, like, why, you know, him, him buying shares of Chewy makes a lot of sense. Like, a lot of sense. Hmm. And I'd also expect him to start acquiring shares in these other, you know, seller boxed companies, which he may be doing. I, I'm not sure about the regulatory and reporting, um, you know, rules around seller boxed or delisted companies or even how you would do that. Hmm. But I'm sure that with at least $250 million at his disposal, he has some of the best lawyers and, you know, financial consultants in town and he'll be able to go and and figure figure this out. And so, again, I think he's telegraphing something, potentially a broader play to go against Amazon. And if that's true, right, Ryan Cohen is really going for the king because Jeff Bezos is one of the wealthiest people in the world. And as that as that famous DD, the bust out scheme indicates, the way that Amazon grew, especially you know through the twenty to late two thousands and early twenty tens, was via bust out schemes. Mm-hmm. Right. They they wanted everyone, they wanted to kill in-store retail shopping. They wanted to kill the big box retailers so that they could move to an all virtual online shopping experience where everything is delivered to your house. And, you know, at the same time, they can put in uh negative characters, right? Um, poison pills into the boards of these uh competitor companies, have these have these board members load the companies with toxic debt, overspend, underinvest, drive the company into bankruptcy, and then and and by the way, along the way, short this thing to the to oblivion. Once it goes bankrupt, then have Amazon swoop in with a magic wand and buy up all the assets for pennies on the dollar, mm. like what normally happens in bankruptcy. And the shorting companies, you know, the shorters make make buku bucks all the way down, and so it, it's profitable for everyone. And their logic would have been, oh, you know, these companies are dying anyways. We're just speeding up the process. Yeah, what's wrong with us making a few quid as it goes down? Yeah, instead of them actually causing the death of these companies. Mm. And you know what? Look what happened with with Red Lobster too just just, uh, about a month ago, two months ago, was also indicative of the same 
virus that's taken place in in the U.S. financial system, right? A private equity firm bought Red Lobster in like 2014, and they started engaging in you know what I would call abusive or manipulative business practices. So okay. they were giving away you know unlimited um, bread rolls. They were doing like extreme deals on lobster that were that were losing the company money. But more importantly, most damningly, they were they went and bought the land out from each of the Red Robin or sorry the Red Lobster um, locations, mm-hmm. and they rented it back to the Red to the Red Lobster Holding Company at thirty percent above market. And so, like, let's say, you know, Red Lobster is a location in L.A., and you know. They that store makes four million a year in revenue, and they pay one million a year in uh, leases. You know, basically leasing the land that mm-hmm. they that that they're under because they don't own it. This company went and bought that land and then leased it to them at one point four million. And that may not seem like much, but for restaurant business, their their margins are razor thin, and so a, a thirty or forty percent increase in in rent expense mm-hmm. is everything. Like that could destroy your entire margin. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's basically what they did. And this this private equity company did that and sucked the money out of Red, you know, Red Lobster, let Red Lobster go into bankruptcy, and they don't give a shit because now they're paid off, right? Yeah. They made all their money back plus extra, and and they own the land underneath it too. So now whoever buys Red Lobster out of bankruptcy is going to have to pay them because it's not really easy to move those uh, restaurant buildings now, is it? So unless you want to demolish it and start anew, you're going to have to pay it, you know, pay them. That is disgusting. I did not know yeah. this story. That is utterly disgusting. Private equity yeah, really- is a virus. It is. It's like, sad it's a, it's a, that it's become that way. It's an absolute parasite. That's disgusting. <sighs> I, I, yeah, it, it, and I, I mean, maybe it's as good. My, my cynicism doesn't get the better of me. Like I'm, I'm still, it doesn't matter how many of these stories I hear, you know, I'm still shocked. <sighs> the disgust never quite wears off, which mm-hmm. I guess is a good thing. Maybe it'd be nice to be numb. <laughs> um, but anyway, so one of the one of the things I wanted to talk about on top of this was what links what do you think links some of these companies? Like all all these companies that Ryan Cohen is acquiring or or seems to be involved in or um all the things within the, the Ryan Cohen sphere, I guess is a better way of putting it. what links these? So there was a yeah, there was a Bed Bath and Beyond. There's been like talk of the headphones manufacturer costs there's chewy there's uh gamestop like what they seem like like a lot of random buys you know what do you think it is that he sees in 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 at least three of these that we know he's he's invested in at some point like Chewy's what, obviously what his baby. Them? yeah like because like I, I i guess it is it the the shorts is that why he's looking at things like uh bed bath and beyond do you think or did he see like a business model that had been like unfairly destroyed by the likes of this private equity and is that why you think he's like interested in this um bed bath and beyond or he was in particular like what do you see as his strategy for buy, for identifying things with value i guess is what i'm asking i think there's two things right um you know, first is he's clearly going after uh, retail focused businesses, right? Mm-hmm. Things that serve the consumer. So first was Chewy, then was GameStop, but we have, you know, Bed Bath and Beyond, potentially Blockbuster, Sears, like all these other companies. Mm-hmm. Um, and you know that retail focus is, I think, part of his legacy that he had with his dad on, you know, hard work serving other people, being a good person, kind, you know, kindness and empathy over everything. Mm -hmm. Right. Ryan, one of Ryan Cohen's famous sayings is, um, children and animals must be protected at all costs. Right. And so because he's, he's, he wants to live out this legacy of his dad, 
he believes that these retail businesses are cornerstone of uh, American and generally like our our capitalist system. And these businesses have been, you know, providers of of jobs, of employment security, of pensions, and of a, you know, a general social meeting place for people for for generations. And what Amazon's done is come in, strip out all the malls, strip out all the all these you know companies, mm. drive them into the ground absolutely demolish their you know pensions and all their assets and then buy them you know buy their assets for pennies on the dollar mm -hmm. and they've replaced it with you know arguably slave warehouses mm -hmm. where people work extreme extremely long hours you're not allowed to pee at you know in, unless it's at certain times you have robots and automation that's taking over everything. And the, the only focus is profitability mm. and not on the customer experience. Nobody cares about the customer anymore. It's just about pumping out as many orders as possible in a single day. Mm. And as I have friends who are Amazon drivers. I have friends who have worked in the warehouses. And from what I've heard, just anecdotally, it's it's brutal. Yeah, it's very yeah I've heard work. the same. It's not easy. Yeah, it's not easy. No, no. They work you very hard. Mm -hmm. And they don't pay. They don't pay extremely well, right? No. They they claim to be paying amazing, but really in reality, they're paying just above minimum wage. Yeah, yeah, and you have to do a lot to earn that. Like the yeah, yeah exactly. the, the 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 speed that, like for example, for the uh, for the delivery drivers, I know they're the the time windows that they give them to deliver a package are just insane and it's everything's calculated it's like okay on average it should take you this long to deliver the package it's like doesn't matter how long the drive is doesn't matter how long the you know how difficult it is to get you know ring the door wait for the person to come answer the door you know they don't calculate any of this stuff and every second that's wasted is is on them it's not it's not amazon that's paying it's it's the the worker that's suffering because they didn't hit the targets uh unfortunately um no I, mm -hmm. another so, thing sorry did you want do you want to okay. say something there? yeah yeah so to finish my point so the first the first reason why i think he's he's connecting all these companies together it's one is because he cares about the customer and he wants retail right he wants big box retailers to have a reemergence again and mm -hmm. actually i would say arguably we're we're kind of at a moment in the you know the social media zeitgeist where that's happening Mm -hmm. The most deleted app in 2023 was Instagram. That's interesting, right? I didn't people, know that. Yeah, people are people are looking and yearning for in person connection, in person shopping experience, in person gathering and meeting places. Mm -hmm. Right. The the most popular, um, some of the most popular businesses and fast growing businesses right now are ones that connect people because we've got, become so disconnected as a society. Mm -hmm. And so Ryan Cohen, I believe, wants to you know foster that. Uh, Foster that attitude and foster that theme throughout his businesses, right? That that's the one of the core central things of Chewy, right? Chewy will send you a letter, mm -hmm. um, you know, if you're uh, on your dog's or your pet's birthday, <laughs> and they'll even ask for pictures of your pet. And if your pet dies, they will send you, you know, condolence letters. Yeah, most companies would not do that, no, because that's a cost to them. But Chewy cares about the customer, right? And so that's mm. that's the first thing. And then the second reason why I think he's going after and you know let's say selecting all these companies is because i think he sees the crime that's happening mm -hmm. and again because of his background with his dad and the strong moral compass that was instilled in him i think he's disgusted i think he you know he knows that this this co these companies are heavily naked shorted they're heavily manipulated and they've been being driven into the ground by this cabal of people who are parasites on the back of capitalism, right? I mean, if again, when you're when you're a college student like I was, and you're taking introductory to finance and economics courses, what you're told is that the markets are efficient, mm -hmm. right? Capital is allocated <laughs> fairly. People <laughs> yeah. people are un the, people are unbiased in their in their um, <laughs> you know promotion and and distribution of equity, right? And that it's fair, and that that. What you're told is that the people who lose are destined to lose because their business is, you know, for some reason or another, worse than another person's business, yeah. right? It's an old, you know, it's the horse and buggy versus car argument. Oh, well, you know, the horse and buggy guys, of course, that they protested what was happening, but it was, their time was up, right? There's a new technology that's coming into the fray that's going to revolutionize transportation. And so therefore, 
you know, those people that were angry and protesting the Luddites that were destroying, you know, steel mills and destroying machine factories, right? Engine factories, because they were mad at these, um, you know, Henry Ford and the other car manufacturers yeah. in the early 1900s. Those people are are off the rocker and they're crazy and they don't understand how capitalism works. But what, what you come to understand is when you get a deeper understanding of the system, right, is that's not the case. A lot yeah. of the time, people who win are not winning because they're better or they're harder working or they have a better product or they're smarter or they solve the issue better than other people. They win because they cheat, right? And so if these people are doing this in mass, and again, they're not doing this to one company, but they're doing this to multiple companies. If the bus out scheme has targeted you know, Sears, Toys R Us, Bed Bath & Beyond, GameStop, right? Maybe even AMC, yeah. right? Like yeah. all these large American companies that are that are staples of um staples of of American culture, yeah, and American society. Yeah. And the bedrock right? of the economy in a lot of ways. Oh, for sure. I mean, th think about this. Think about this. Like let's take again, take GameStop for an example. If you obviate the need for GameStop, if you completely destroy GameStop and all the gamers now go and buy all the games on Steam, hmm. who really benefits? Steam. Okay, so maybe <laughs> Steam. Well, well, yeah. <laughs> but, but, but who within Steam, hmm. right? So it, in a distributed you know, software company, if you have 3x the, the consumer volume, you might only need to in increase headcount by 20%, yeah. 30%. Yeah, yeah. Right? And the delta between the revenues and the expenses will grow, and that will result in greater profits for the shareholders and the CEO and the C-suite who are already wealthy people. So we're yeah. talking about people who already have millions of dollars, right? If they if they founded Steam, they're worth you know 30, 40 million at least. And then now their income goes from you know two million a year to 10 million a year. Mm -hmm. Great, amazing that we made one rich guy even more wealthy. But all the jobs, all the jobs that are tied to this, like the retail focused jobs, the guy you know in GameStop who helps you find your game, the the chick who helps you you know price your collectible correctly, mm -hmm. the other guy at the counter who does the trade ins, all those people's jobs are gone. And what do those people do? Right there, there's no options for them. Yeah, they go work. And so what you go work in the Amazon that. warehouse. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you go work. You go work slave wages for mm -hmm. Jeff Bezos. And you you're you should be happy. And just like that picture in um, you know, Tijuana, Mexico, the Amazon warehouse in Tijuana, yeah. there's shanty towns outside the warehouse. That shows you what the future is like under that model. Yeah. Under that model, everyone's remote, the middle class slowly gets eaten away, and the gap between the rich and the poor grows steadily until we basically would have a blood a bloody revolution. Yeah. And that's it. Right. That's how these things go. And that is an incredibly sad um, conclusion to come to. And I think Ryan Cohen sees that future and he doesn't want that for anybody. And I wouldn't either. If I was a billionaire and I could take some action against that and I knew that these people on Amazon, these parasites were destroying companies and replacing them with, you know, ultra profitable, but ultra, you know, extractory or exploitative uh, models that were just printing money from from removing people in the in yeah. the value chain, I would say that that's wrong too, you know. Unfortunately, that that's very much where the the system that we've arrived at. Uh, and I, do you think the world needs activist investors like like Ryan Cohen in, in that sense? Like, is that is is that what we we're going to be forced to rely on? Is is some some people to at least make the beachhead? in a, like a, 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 an attempt to reclaim those more human spaces that you talked about. We need a lot more of them for sure. We do need, we do need Ryan Cohen, but we need even more than him. Right. He's, he's one of, um, one of many that we, that is in a fight that's, that's against this, but there, there, there's not enough of them. That's the, that's the sad truth. Right. There's just so many investors who don't give a shit about how they make the returns. They just want to juice the returns. Yeah. And they're willing to cheat and lie and steal in order to get there. Because again, at the end of the day, for them, money is everything. Yeah.
So speaking of billionaires who are at least on the surface claiming they're trying to improve the country, why does Ryan Cohen keep tweeting about Donald Trump? So this is another, again, another rabbit hole, more <laughs> tinfoil, right? I love tinfoil. Some more interesting, <laughs> some more interesting tinfoil, because I believe Trump might have a role to play in this naked short, this war against naked shorting. And the reason is because, right, Trump was deplatformed and mm -hmm. taken off of basically every single social media platform by the, you know, liberal and left leaning um apparatus that runs most of the social media today mm -hmm. and in response to that in like 2021 he started truth social which was basically an alternative to twitter that was meant to just basically be a free uh, a free place for speech yeah. for political you know maybe political and ideological distance from the mainstream views right so that ranges from everyone everyone from conspiracy theorists to alt-right guys to you know your grandma posting weird, you know, tinfoil theories on BBY, mm -hmm. everything, and yeah. have it just be an uncensored spot. And Trump. And Donald Trump's, yeah, <laughs> and mostly are centered around Trump, right? Uh, to be fair. And Trump listed this equity um, on, you know, I think it's on ARCA. Mm -hmm. And so it's a, it's like kind of a penny stock. And it started trading and immediately massive shorts opened up on it. And leading up to the assassination attempt, um, there was heavy, heavy uh, activity. I was actually listed on NASDAQ. Okay. Oh, it's $35. Um, but yeah, so they, they underwent heavy, heavy shorting activity and heavy uh, – they saw heavy put buying activity in the stock in the weeks and months before the assassination attempt. And most famously, there was a 12 million share short by uh, a company called I think it's like Austin Austin um, Investing Collective, which has ties to George W. Bush and George H. W. Bush, and kind of the good old boys of the '80s and '90s, uh, Ray, you know, Republican Reagan era. Mm -hmm. And those people, by the way, had been instrumental during you know the Iran Contra conflict and or the uh, controversy. And the um, you know the Soviet and the Cold War uh, propaganda against the Russians and the and the nuclear arms deals that were made, they were instrumental in keeping those uh, those things from actually coalescing into a a broader peace plot. So mm -hmm. they were they were the people who stopped from happening. I mean, Russia, like Ronald Reagan, met with uh, Premier Gorbachev in the late eighties and sat down with him and basically denied signing a, a peace pact. And George H. W. H. W. Bush um, was director of the CIA for like eight years, was a key advisor to a lot of these presidents, and then eventually is a president himself. And he's been involved in a lot of a lot of scandals and conflicts, and some of them are you know known to the public pretty well. Some of them aren't. Mm -hmm. You know, there's some CIA documents that Ian Carroll can take you through mm -hmm. that show evidence that. Um, H.W. Bush was helping to funnel uh, drugs into Vietnam and taking and selling it to U.S. soldiers and taking the funds and putting them to black black box CIA accounts to pay for illegal operations that the Congress did not know of or fund. And so, essentially, running a drug, essentially running a drug empire, mm. right? So that that's what this is connected to. And so, this anyway, this company, uh, I think it's called Austin Investing Collective or something like that. Yeah, it's it's based in Texas. They shorted 12 million shares of DJT right before, like literally the day before the uh, the assassination attempt. Mm. So that's strange. And when I looked at the other trading activity, right, um, and I can even like look at it right now because I think I still have it pulled up. We have okay, so that company is called Austin Private Wealth LLC. We also have Bank of America. Uh, Hudson Bay. So Hudson Bay was – they were a company that was a counterparty to Archegos for GameStop <laughs> basket swaps. If you read the reports, they had been deep into um, basket and portfolio swaps, including GME, and they were subpoenaed on the Archegos case. And they're mentioned there multiple times. And the 
the founder of Hudson Bay is a former Citadel managing director. So that's another another rabbit hole to dive down. But okay, next person or next entity, Citadel Advisors LLC. <laughs> 100 1.6 million puts. Okay, uh, Wolverine Trading. Wolverine Trading was the market maker that made options in GameStop stock during uh, 2020 and 2021 uh, during the meme stock market event, right? What we call the sneeze. So they were the designated market maker for options, not for shares. Yeah. Okay. Um, Square Point, Crawford, Pentwater, Millennium. Millennium's a large hedge fund that's very well known. Goldman Sachs. Meteora Capital, K2 Principal Fund, another, um, you know, uh, kind of Citadel slash Goldman protege. Hmm. Susquehanna, <laughs> uh, FNY Advisors, Global Retirement Partners, Hightower, another, um, you know, hedge fund, right? So we're talking about all these hedge funds that had heavy trading activity before uh, – before the assassination attempt on President Donald Trump. And Donald Trump has been continuing in the background to do um, you know, lawsuits regarding naked shorting in the stock because he believes that there's been illicit activity in the trading volume and, and short interest of his of his shares, mm-hmm. right? Which is which is fair, right? There's a lot of entities that might want to see him go down. And so you know, the the idea, the connection with Trump and Ryan Cohen, at least as far as I can surmise, is that Trump may be trying to, you know, either replace Gensler or strong arm Gensler into actually taking real action against abusive naked short selling. Hmm. And Ryan Cohen might be back channeling with Trump to figure out how best to do this and how to settle, right, this naked short selling issue once and for all. So why is Jamie Demon or Diamond Demon? Demon, the former Goldman, is it former Goldman Sachs dude? Why is he being yeah. cited as Trump's potential pick for Treasury Secretary? Like, that's not exactly fucking kicking out the cabal. Um, so, yeah, JP Morgan. Um, sorry, not Goldman Sachs. Yeah, I was going to say, JP, he, he comes from JP Morgan. He's been CEO there for quite a few years. Yeah. Um, he... From okay, I've heard this through the grapevine, so it's unconfirmed. But okay. what, from what I've heard, he is not going to take the role because he doesn't want it. Mm. But the 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 problem is is in the financial world, you need allies, and so you need to create you know strange bedfellows to help you destroy other strange bedfellows, right? So it's not like you can really get into this world and keep your hands clean. You can't jump in and say, I'm only going to stick with only good guys because guess what? That's about 5% of them. Mm. And you'll be able to make a small coalition that won't make any change. What you need to do is figure out who the enemy of your enemy is and make him your friend and have him help you destroy you know, your enemy or at least how you see it. So I believe you know, the Jamie Dimon thing could be a strategic and tactical move to take on someone who is an incumbent, powerful financial uh, player and have him help you destroy another powerful incumbent financial player, which would be Ken Griffin. Because to take out a, to take out a, a, you know, a king like that, you have to use another king. You have to use someone of equal or greater power and, and with resources and, and information that you do not have. So, again, it, it we may want to live in this world where you know, the good guys only corroborate with the good guys and are able to just only uh, only work with the most up, upright and up, upstanding people to get the job done. But in a lot of times, you have to work with horrible people, just like how the FBI has to use informants who are former drug dealers or kidnappers or murderers. Um, same thing could be true here. But from what I understand, he is not going to take the role in uh, in being Treasury Secretary because from, you know, the rumors is that he doesn't want the heat. It's just too much, too much work to and too much pressure to to be treasury secretary. But he may assign one of his proteges. But whatever Trump does, you know, if he's going to go after naked short sellers for real, with Ryan Cohen helping to back him and Elon Musk helping to back him, because Elon Musk just donated mm. forty five million dollars to a super PAC to elect Donald Trump. Yeah, he's pledged um, forty five million a month. I heard. 
a month. Yeah, repeating. So yeah. it's a lot of money. Well, so, for him, not so much. <laughs> no, no, yeah. For him, it's not Didn't he just money. have his pay but, packet approved? What was that? Tens of billions. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So it's in the grand scheme of things, it's not that much, but it is a, a big commitment from yeah. From Elon. yeah. I'm sure it'll go to um, good, good use. <laughs> well maybe. oh for sure so but, like you're, you're again, talking about this like you think trump is the good guy um well is that why they again, shot is that why they shot him because they did shoot him he did actually hit him they just you know failed to kill him i i have a very nuanced take right like people on the right will get mad at me people on the left will get mad at me because people that's good. Want i like i like those takes simple. that's that's perfect people <laughs> want the world to be simple man there is no simple. There is no. There is no simple and and you know, easy to understand world. It's a complex world. Even the best presidents that you might think of, right? Like JFK was a womanizer and cheated on his wife <laughs> a lot. Yes, like a lot. Like and a he lot. also did. He also used drugs to get over the pain that he was having from uh, multiple back surgeries. Mm. Right? Uh, that I blame so him for. Was, this, but yeah. So if you look at it one way, he's a drug addicted cheater. Mm. Or you could see him as a guy who tried to take away the power of issuing money from the Fed, a guy who tried to, you know, highlight is Israel as a um, foreign agent, you know, APAC, a guy who tried to, uh, you know, destroy the C like basically obviate the need for the CIA and 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 put it back under the Department of Defense control and mm -hmm. and section out each function of the CIA and hand it to a different part different part of the military. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, you can look at things different ways. And I think Trump is is the same way. He's a complex character. He's not a you, you know, a monolith good or bad person. Like anyone, he has mixed qualities. And you know, he has some good qualities fighting for more domestic manufacturing, fighting for workers' rights, right? Fighting to make people make sure people's voices are heard. And then he has some bad qualities too. And I'm not going to deny that, you know, he he obviously has bad qualities like anyone does and he's bad made bad policy decisions like anyone does and again i'm not a i, I don't really get into politics so I, i'm not here to debate that yeah but yeah. if if you think of if you think of it from ryan cohen's perspective right if he's a pro businessman if and if he is especially if he's a single issue voter and if the naked shorting thing is the most important thing for him who's more likely to actually help him in that fight is it going to be biden or trump mm. it's going to be trump and so again, just like with the Jamie Dimon, uh, you know, election, like I told you, the strange bedfellows thing, strange bedfellows, man, like Ryan Cohen just wants to get this naked shorting thing fucking over with. And he knows that's going to be, it's like removing a tumor from the financial system. It's going to be very difficult and very painful because a lot of people are going to lose a lot of money and they're powerful and they have politicians on their side and interests on their side and they've capped, paid off some regulators. And so they're not going to go down without a fight either. So to take down the bully, you have to find another bully. Yeah, I mean, I, it's going to mean hurt for a lot of people, I'd say, unfortunately. Uh, it being just the nature of what happens when, when there's big turmoil in a financial market that's like way too embedded in the rest of our economy. Uh, you know, <clears throat> the health of those financial firms shouldn't dictate the the health of the rest of the economy and unfortunately their 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 tendrils are everywhere uh in every board you know starting from blackrock but working your way down like the amount of positions that people like citadel have in every single firm on you know that, that that you you can never even think of is yeah that's that's the most astounding part to me it's that you know the economy is not the economy because it's nothing to do with the performance of the businesses at the heart of it, unfortunately, anymore. And I guess Ryan Cohen is hoping to push us back towards a place where that might once again be true. Um, so this feels like a wonderful place to to, to wrap up because um, we've gone over what I said we would. Um, so I yeah, don't want to keep you too long. So uh, is there things you want to point people towards, man? Yeah, sure. So um, I have, obviously, you can follow me on Twitter at Peruvian Bull. I have a of a YouTube as well, Peruvian Bull. I also write on Substack. I've written several pieces on GME. I've written GME DD. That's on my Reddit. Um, I'm not as active on Reddit anymore. I will probably get back to posting occasionally on Reddit um, when I have when I have the time. Um, but I'm excited, man. I mean, this these developments these last few months have been really telling. And again, the amount of capital and money that's been throwing around um, has shown me that this is. I, I, you know, I had a famous tweet, and if 
you can find it and put it on the screen. That'd be cool. Um, you know, it, it, and I think I think he essentially said uh, there's a war going on between the institutions, and GME is the battleground. And what I meant by that is, you know, it appears that from the options flow, from the from the block trading flow, that there are large institutions that are taking positions against Citadel, against you know, um, point seventy two, and all these other uh, hedge funds, Citron, that have taken short positions in GME, because there are block trades that are happening, especially on the option side, for super far out of the money call options, long dated, um, and short dated in the millions of dollars per contract premium every single week. So we're seeing buying at the, at the extreme, you know, the highest call option, buying at a very high level that is continual, continuous and repetitive and in the millions of dollars, which tells me that's not, um, not retail. Right. Mm. So there are some institutions that are taking positions against GME uh, or against the, the institutions that are shorting GME. They're, they're fighting for Jimmy, and there are institutions that are fighting against. And so this war that's been taking on is 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 continuing with the DFE's reemergence and Ryan Cohen, you know, um, supporting Trump potentially and and using this collaboration with Trump to try to go after naked shorts. Um, and that could mean that we could see a reimagining of the financial system, right? If these if these people are finally caught with their pants down and we see a squeeze in all these stocks, they would get bankrupted. They would get um, you know, basically liquidated and their power and their uh, influence on the financial system would be largely reduced or eliminated, which means that we could get rid of that problem once and for all, which mm. would be an amazing solution. But we'll have to wait and see what happens. Well, it's going to be a, it's going to be a wild ride. So for sure. Yeah, man, um, I really appreciate your time. Thanks very much. Glad we finally got to, to do this again. And I checked before we started that the audio has all worked this time wonderfully. Uh, touch wood. Um, and yeah, so this will be out in yeah a couple of days. And then people who are watching, the next interview will be Suzanne Trimbath talking about her latest book, A Decade of Armageddon. Uh, so make sure you subscribe if you want to see that. Uh, so yeah thanks very much awesome thanks so much appreciate it i'll see you hey listeners real quick do you ever find yourself sitting watching the stock market like this well now you could instead be ordering my book like this it's the story of gamestop you can purchase it with a hoodie with acknowledgements or just with the early backers edition it's all about the gamestop story it's the real story not just what you've seen on films it's exactly what has happened over the last three and a half years. And with DFE back, I'm finally able to draw a conclusion to my book. Please pre-order it. It really helps me out. And you will get it eventually, I promise. Hopefully this year.